But I want to sort of give you an idea of what is happening with all the data that is being generated by this project based on the specimens that Penelope was accessioning. So like she said, those numbers that are associated with those specimens now are the numbers that we get when people request our collections. They say we want UC number 326 of Mycena or whatever. Um, and some of those will correspond to specimens that we have chosen to include in the sequencing project that the Public Federation provided all the funding for. Now what happens when you choose something to be sequenced? Well basically I take a little bit of it and I put it in a mailing tube, a little Eppendorf tube basically, and send it to a lab in Spain called Alva Labs. And the reason we chose them is that they will take our dirty chunk of mushroom and turn it into a sequence and clean it up and give us um, a little bit of background on it uh, for a reasonable price. Cheaper basically than anything we could find in the United States because they allow us to send them a raw mushroom fragment. Um, a lot of places request that you give them a PCR product, which is basically a couple steps in, and then they'll give you a sequence back. Um, but Alva Labs allows us to just send mushrooms, which is great, because we don't really have the means to generate PCR products on our own, because we're citizens, we're not academics. We don't have that machinery and expertise available to us quite as easily. So that's what happens. Um, next slide. Part of the reason that we're doing this project is that we've all had the experience of being out in Redwood Forest and finding these guys. Waxing caps. Well, these are hygroscopy citocyna, right? Next slide. Well, maybe. Depends on where you look. We go back one slide. We're not even sure if these are really the same thing. I mean, they're growing right next to each other. They look really similar, but their colors are really wildly different. So I'm going to talk in a couple slides about what a DNA barcode can help us answer, what kinds of questions it can help us get the root of. So next slide, and one more. So things that I want to know about mushrooms that this project is going to help answer. What is the diversity of mushrooms in Santa Cruz County? How does it relate to the diversity of mushrooms in California or in North America at large? What is their distribution? Where do the mushrooms that live here grow more generally? Are they restricted to Santa Cruz County? Are they restricted to California? Are they common around the world? Are they invasive? Are they coming from outside areas and infiltrating our forests? And what's their status? Are these mushrooms that are on the increase? Are their populations growing? Or are they really rare range-restricted species that are threatened by increasing development or um, changing climate regimes? Next slide. So as I was putting the talk together for the Cal Academy, I was really trying to get at the core of what I wanted to do with the Santa Cruz Mycoflora website, which is what Adam Riska, who's the corner you guys probably know Adam, has been totally instrumental in piecing together. Um, not only because it's going to help us answer these kinds of questions, but it's the format in which we are making the data from this project public. Without the Santa Cruz Mycoflora website, there wouldn't be anywhere near as good of a way for us to show off the results of our project. Um, but anyways, I had to get at the core of what it was that we were doing at Santa Cruz Microflora. Dot O-R-G if you're interested. Um, you're interested. Uh, and at the core of what I want to do on Santa Cruz Microflora is to provide what I call full suite biodiversity data. And what that means is that there's three things that go into the identity, and then three more things that I'll talk about later. So the three things that go into establishing the identity of any organism, in our case mushrooms, are an image, and it doesn't necessarily actually have to be an image, because other organisms can be, say, a sound recording. Um, but whatever it is that the average person, you and I, a non-savant, goes into the woods and experiences. And the image is important because most of us experience mushrooms visually. That's how we know these organisms. The second part of this is the quantified data, or what I call the Q data. This is things like spore measurements, um, color of the spores, um, something that the average person doesn't measure, you know, that isn't part of their sensory experience of the organism, but goes a long way towards helping you identify it. And the third piece is the DNA barcode, and that's something that no one experiences in the woods, and very few people ever get the chance to measure directly themselves. Um, and the reason that this third part is important is because, next slide, um, it allows us to do ID triangulation, to have a tiebreaker, basically, in cases where two pieces of uh, data conflict with each other. And don't give us a clear answer, we can go to a third one to sort of break ties. 
Um, so for example, that photo of those two hygrosophy, they look really different colors, suggesting they're different species. But the quantitative data, the microscopy, shows that there's not much difference. So we need a timer. And DNA data can help us do that. Now it doesn't always work. It doesn't always provide the sort of smoking gun you want, but it's one piece of information that's qualitatively different from the other two kinds that really helps you get a better sense of what you're doing. So all those three pieces of information are what I call the components of identity, establishing the identity of your organism. But the identity of the organism is only so interesting. You can only collect stamps for so long. The next piece is what I find really interesting, but to which identity is the foundation. So next slide. The ecology of these organisms. So once we've established who they are, and we can learn to recognize them, a lot of people start asking, what are they doing? Why are they important? What role do they play in the environment? And the three pieces that I consider to be necessary to establish basic ecology data for someone to ask uh, interesting questions about is, where does this organism live? Does it live in Santa Cruz? Does it live near me? Do I need to learn it? Do I need to learn to recognize it? What does it do over time? Does it have any sort of time associated or seasonal phenomena associated with it? Is it absent for some of the year? Does it migrate if you're talking about birds? Well, with mushrooms, we're talking about when does it fruit, right? So that's the sort of phenology data that I want to attach to it. And the last, but certainly not least, what interactions and actions does this organism have? What trees is it mycorrhizal with? What trees does it kill? What humans does it feed or what humans does it poison? All of that ecological data, its interactions with its habitat, with other organisms around it, is super critical for establishing ecology data. Now when you have all of these six pieces together, next slide, you have what I call full suite biodiversity data. Now it's not as deep as you might want it, but it's got all of the starting roads to lead away in any number of directions. Um, so you can ask a lot of different questions, and having these six pieces in one place will really help you answer those questions faster and more efficiently. And that's what I'm trying to do on Santa Cruz Microflora. And thanks to Adam's help, we're achieving it. Um, okay, so these are a few of the databases that I'm involved with online. eBird is for birds, mushroom observer is for mushrooms, iNaturalist is for basically any organism of any kind. Um, and the great thing about these sort of portals is that they often have real-time data. The data comes in every day. You see what's fruiting right now. You can coordinate projects, so you can have sort of focused um, questions that data comes in to answer. They're image you get a lot of images, you really get a sense of the organism because you see a new picture of it maybe every day. Um, and they're geo -reference. All the data that comes into these portals have, is mapped. You can see where this action is happening. But there's a lot of stuff this leaves to be desired. Mushroom Observer, for those of you who use it, you know there's a lot that you wish mushrooms ever did that it doesn't. And that's sort of the gap that we're hoping to try to fill with the Santa Cruz microflora, is to take that data and turn it into something a little bit easier to digest. Um, some narratives that are a little cleaner, a little more curated, less likely to be full of errors, um, and sort of package it for the people in this county, um, sort of trim off the excess data and give you something clear that you can engage with and learn from. OK, next slide. So, back to the rare sequencing project. How does this fit into all this? Well, it gives us that DNA barcode. Um, and that's one of the components that we would be missing if we didn't have this funding. Um, next slide. It goes towards establishing the identity of the organism that we're dealing with. Next one. So this is what it looks like when you land on the Mycota of Santa Cruz homepage. Um, our core value is right here in the species index. Next slide. It'll take you to a list of genera, you choose one, and you get some images of what members of that genus look like, the list of all the ones that are known from our county. Notice that it's only our county. Unlike Mushroom Observer, where you can go and see bullies from all over the world, it's a little bit harder to sort through. Santa Cruz Microflora is intended to be a very focused and clear project for people who live here. You get to learn some about their ecology and their importance to humans and the organisms around them. So that's part of those last three pieces of biodiversity data the ecology part. Um, and you have links out to both MycoPortal and Mushroom Observer so that you can get to all of that phenology data. When are they fruiting? Those are the databases that will tell you things about when these mushrooms fruit, um, when they're not present, 
where else they live, because these are mapping tools as well. So you can link out to a map. Um, we, for various reasons, it's not as practical for us to host those maps, so we decided to link out to them to more dedicated databases. So next. Now you go to a single species, sorry, one back, and it will tell you all about the ecology of that one species. And it will give you a number of pictures of that one species, including microscopic images sometimes. And then it will give you some of the peak fruiting months. So it gives you sort of a digested version of the phenology data. Okay, next. So we've seen how we sort of are attempting to address this. Um, what results have we got? Well, we've certainly gotten clear indications that some of the mushrooms we've sequenced are novel species that have not been described. We've gotten some diversity estimates for Santa Cruz County. If you were to ask someone how many mushrooms live in California, there's a lot of hand waving. People can guess for you, but not that many people can point to a specific number. And we're starting to give sort of a basis in data for answering that question if someone asks about Santa Cruz. We've gotten some range data. We found out that mushrooms that grow here also grow in British Columbia, also grow in uh, you know, New Mexico, also grow um, through the Redwood Coast, and maybe are associated specifically with redwoods. Um, and there have been a few surprises, but there's been a lot more confirmation of what we expected, which is good. It means we're probably doing something accurate. Um, and then we have, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, what this means, but we have started to place names and faces to sequences. Um, how many of you have heard of GenBank? So it's a repository for all of the genetic data generated by the academic community. It's a swamp. Um, there's a ton of data, and it's sort of the database of note that you use if you're generating sequences, but there's a lot of issues with it, and we like to think that what we're doing here is going to help them solve some of their problems. But that's sort of, we need to catch their attention and show them what we're doing in order for that um, to, fulfill, to fulfill its potential. So, next slide. Some novel taxa. How many of you have seen the little gray-capped bulbidius that grows in the oak woodlands? Um, it's similar to the sunny side up, but it's got a gray cap and it grows on oak or tan oak usually. We had a conversation about this on the Mushroom Observer. Is bulbidius luriatus really a good name for this mushroom? Our preliminary genetic data suggests, no, it's definitely not the European one. It's almost certainly an undescribed species that needs a name. Um, and we, as far as I can tell, have one of five, only five or six sequences of it in GenBank, most of which are incorrectly identified as Luriatus, because that's the only name we've had. Um, but by doing this and providing an image at the same time, we give people a better idea of what they're dealing with. When you go into GenBank a lot of times, you'll see Bulbidius Luriatus, and you'll see the sequence, and that's about all you can figure out. You don't know where it came from, who identified it that way, what habitat it lived in. You don't even know if it's from Europe or the United States. So it's not very informative for a taxonomy. But because we're pairing it with all of those other six pieces of data on Santa Cruz microflora, it suddenly becomes a much richer data set, all in one place, where any question that might pop into your head right off the bat, you can find the answer to, ideally, in a well-illustrated way, and very clearly stated right on our website. All right, next page. Antilopo medianox. How many of you, I'm introducing this to the world now, how many of you remember Antilopo bloxamia? <laughs> That's a European species name. Doesn't really look like this one if you're familiar with both of them, and it grows in grasslands in nitrogen poor meadow settings. Totally unlike ours. But it looks close enough that we use that name for years. Well, Pablo, um, sorry, not Pablo, um, Luis Morgado. Uh, Nerdlos, who is the European antelope expert, recently published a paper on this group of species where they investigated the entire group in Western North America, Eastern North America, and Europe, gave them a bunch of new names, sorted out species concepts, and stopped just short of giving this one a new name. <laughs> they said the only unidentified mushroom in their entire paper was this one. Uh, it didn't have a species name associated with it, and they said Antelope bloxamii is since in California. And they said, the sequences clearly show it's different, the, micros or the microscopic data clearly show it's different, but we've never seen this mushroom, so we're not going to describe it. And I said, well, I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> because it fruits here super commonly every fall, right? I mean, almost everyone is familiar with this mushroom. But what we didn't have was enough data to say that sequence in their paper definitely matches ours. So what we did is we sequenced, not this collection, but one very similar to it, um, 
from the UCSC campus, actually. Um, and then we took one from Fall Creek, and we established these have the same ITS sequence as the mushroom that they included in their study. It was 100% match. There was like, I think, two ambiguous positions probably due to sequencing errors. And other than that, there was nothing else in the database that came close. So we were able to say pretty definitively, this mushroom, the blue one that we all know and love, is what they were talking about. And so we can situate it in their phylogenetic tree and give it a new name and tell them a medianox, which in Latin means midnight, because of this midnight blue color, and because the aurora used the common name midnight and Tulum. So it was a way of tying sort of people's familiarity with the color and just giving it a name that was appropriate for the West Coast species. Um, so there you go. Um, next, Rhodosity. <coughs> Many of you probably aren't familiar with these. They're not as common, they're certainly not as big or beautiful, but it turns out we're finding that a lot of these things in California are not described. We've, once again, been borrowing names from either Europe or, in this case, from um, Northern and Eastern North American names. So we don't know if this is really Rhodosity or Neola. How many of you have met Tim Maroney? Some of you have probably seen him speak here. Um, but he studies this group, and I've been in correspondence with him about these mushrooms, and he is suggesting ways in which we can, none of these so far have been included in our um, sequencing project, but they're probably going to be in the next round because of my correspondence with Tim. He said, we've got a good data set. If you can give us some of the data from your project, we can plug it right in and see where they fit and work on describing these mushrooms or figuring out if they're already described. It looks like this one may be Rhodosity hondensis, named after La Honda, same place that Agaricus hondensis was named. Um, collected by Merle way back at the turn of the century. But if we can prove that by generating um, an ITS sequence from this project, we'll be the first people, really, to definitively associate you know, an image like this with the type collection from Merle. Um, Tim Brody has been using that name, but he hasn't definitively proven that they're the same thing. So we want to work with him to make sure that we can do that at some point. Um, but it looks like this guy, this guy, and this guy are undescribed. So that may be three new species that we get out of our sequencing project. So we're getting some diversity estimates. We have some pretty good data-based assertions that there's a thousand plus macrofungi. By the time we're through, and we're never going to be through, but by the time this project is 10 years old, there's going to be maybe two or three times this number. When you get into the little ascomycetes that grow in wood, crust fungi, um, now, that, we're nowhere near that right now, but we hope that by getting a critical mass of people paying attention to what we're doing here, they will donate their time and resources towards doing this. How many of you have met Saba Kirstic? Um, he lives over in Cupertino now, but he's a recent transplant to the Oregon Mycological Society. And he goes up to Big Basin after work, and he photographs bizarre little ascomyces that I never would have noticed, and probably his work has added, I don't know, 10 or 15 species to our list in the past two months. Um, I think having him here is going to dramatically increase how much we know about the county. So I'm really excited that by continuing to do this, I like to think we attract skill to our area. Um, okay, next slide. Who recognizes this range map? What species is this? It's not Shin Charles. What's that? Yeah, it's Hawaii's. Yeah. So mostly coastal, mostly central coastal. A few records in Southern California trickling in. It's making its way up north with the occasional plunge of hardwood or even jumping over to conifers. Now what really struck me today is this guy. Holy hell, it's in Montana. Turns out that's not true. I went and investigated this, and it's an Amazon Jamada that someone misidentified. So what we're hoping to do on Santa Cruz Microflora is take these range maps and clean them up. And not necessarily just dot, 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 but to putting some gray areas to say, we expect this mushroom's here. If you're nearby, go find it and tell us, is it there? Who can tell me where the southern limit of Amanita muscaria is in California? I don't know either, but I do know it's in Baja. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be down there somewhere, right? Or maybe it doesn't, I don't know. But these are the kind of questions we want to answer. And we think that by making Santa Cruz mycoflora the website more robust, we can get people to help us answer. Next slide. So undefined sequences in GenBank, this is what they look like. It's a miserable scene. You get sequence back, 
100% match to uncultured Basidio by C clone. Now, that sounds super undignified to me. But what we can say is, hey, researcher, you deposited the sequence. Do you want to know what it corresponded to? We have an image of this mushroom. We have a face that you can put and a name that you can put to the sequence, which I think is really exciting. This sequence was part of a study authored by Smith, Bean, and Barr on um, Pinus sylvestris ectomycorrhizae. And they basically said, OK, here's one of these things. It's a basidiomycete, and it's doing this in the environment, but we don't really know what it is. But we can help them. And I think that's a really dramatic thing that we can do for this community, is give them faces to associate to the actors in their ecological studies. <coughs> Next slide. So what have we shown that amateurs can do? We've shown that we can observe and record basically anything. For some reason, we're interested in mushrooms. I don't know why. But look at us all. Here we are. <laughs> we can cover huge areas. The Mushroom Observer Range Map has dots on every continent. Noah got his friend to stash a piece of bread under her uh, bunk while she was in Antarctica, and it got moldy. So now we have a Mushroom Observer record from there. Um, <laughs> Africa is starting to give a lot more of their data in the last couple of years. There's these people in South Africa who are just contributing a bunch now. Um, there's guys in India who have really taken the mushroom observer. We're finding out about the area called the Western Ghats, um, which is some remarkable habitat that I would love to get to someday. But it's basically filling in these blanks. There's starting to be all these images that people can sort of get a feeling of, but fingers on the pulse of the diversity in these different areas. Um, we can survey efficiently. Mushrooms are a difficult group to go out and get a snapshot of. But I don't know how many of you were involved in the Point Reyes mycoblitzes. They had a bunch of amateurs go out and collect, and then they would tally up the species counts at the end of the day. And after, I think, only four visits, they were up to 450 species for Point Reyes. So we can do this really efficiently, and certainly much more efficiently than two or three academics who are specialized in one genus visiting once every 10 years when they can get away from advising their students. We can really do this quick and efficiently. Um, that's especially helpful when you're dealing with a diverse and conspicuous group like mushrooms. And we can do longitudinal frequent sampling. I don't know how many of you have seen Darwin DeShazer's Mushroom Observer um, uh, records from his yard, basically. You can just get these people who are super local, and they adopt a patch and just report every year, every week, every month of the rainy season, we'll see what's coming up there. And that ends up building these really valuable data sets for ecologists. Then you have people like Ron Pastorino, who appears not to, you know, he's pulled up anchor, and he just drives around and does mushroom observer wherever he is, in Texas or in Oregon or in California. And that's a different kind of value that amateurs are providing. Um, we get a real good sense of biogeography thanks to the work of people like Ron. Next. So Mushroom Observer is just shy of 10 years old now. It's got over 175,000 observations, over 500,000 images, which is more than I think they want. Um, and they're getting over 12,000 different taxa. And that's not including all the unidentified quaternary spud. So there's still a lot of different mushrooms. It's pretty amazing that this is just what amateurs have done. Uh, for those of you next, um, who haven't seen Thomas Laxton's <coughs> photography, this guy walks out into the woods. As far as I know, no one's ever met him. Is he in the room? He might be in the room. Um, and he takes slime molds home, and he puts them under his dissecting scope, and he stacks these photos together and makes these beautiful images. I think Santa Cruz may have a better documented museum of slime mold photos than any other county in California now. He has like 400, 500 observations of these things. So I am just consistently amazed at the neurodiversity of people who are on Mushroom Observer, citizen scientists. They consistently surprise me with how much work they're willing to do for free, just because they love doing it. Um, so next, that's just the Mushroom Observer map. We're all over the place. Um, next. So what I want to communicate to you is the Fungus Federation has found a structure that works. You have a group of people who are a resource pool. You run such a successful public outreach event every year that you have the money as well as the interest to invest in projects like this. You found some Nexus folks, me and Adam and Penelope and Phil, all the people who really concentrate and mentor people um, and turn all of this uh, resources and their academic contacts into a focused project like Santa Cruz Microflora or the Herbarium Sequencing Project. 
we have enough academic contacts who are friendly with the club, the people at UC Berkeley, um, who are willing to help us process our data and submit our data <coughs> and give us advice when we run against stumbling blocks that are out of our area of expertise. And we have, thanks to Adam, a public face. We have the Santa Cruz Microflora website where all of this data can be neatly presented. So this is, I think, a generalizable structure. We found it. We're lucky. But we can tell other groups, hey, this is a great model. Get some resources, find some people to act as middlemen, to harness all this power, all of these people who are out in the woods taking pictures and providing resources, and then make some academic contacts and have them all work together in some way that provides a public fix so people can access what you're doing. Next slide. So we've seen what amateurs can do. What can academics do? They can facilitate access to literature, equipment, collections, both ingoing and outgoing. We're super lucky that Chris Lay at the museum has allowed us to ingo our collections. We have somewhere to put these things. But we could use some um, more facilitation with regards to access towards um, specimens that are in other museums. I recently tried to access a paratech collection of Saffarella Uliganicola, which grows at Phil's yard. And we've been having a little bit of an argument online about whether or not our mushroom is the same as this original species from Idaho. And so I was like, well, we'll just settle this. I'll request the collection, we'll inspect it and compare them and figure out whether or not they're the same. And they said, sorry, we can't love you. You're not, you're not an institution. I said, well, no, now I'm not an institution. I'm just me. Um, so I need help from academics to say, to re help me request and gain access to that specimen. And this is a problem for anyone who's operating on their own. Um, so yeah, that's something academics can do. Next slide. What else can academics do? They can provide expertise. When it comes down to hard identifications, when I'm confused about whether or not my rhodoscopy is really different, I can email Tim. But it's important that we have Tim there. He's an academic contact. We don't have to bother him all the time. He doesn't have the time to deal with that, but we can do most of the work ourselves, and when it gets down to the wire, we can go ask him, hey, what do you think about this? <coughs> they can provide technical analyses of our data. It's really hard to, or to work with um, sequence data sometimes. It's not always clear what the results are. You need to massage it, you need to prepare it using different methods, and they can provide us some of that expertise. Um, they can help us annotate our sequences. So submitting our sequences to GenBank will likely be the final step, because it's a very important step, and it's very labor-intensive. Um, but Josh Birkbeck, some of you probably met him, helped me do the last round of DNA annotation I did, and oh my god, I would have stood zero chance if he did not help me. It was like pulling teeth. But for some reason, just because he's excited about what we're doing, he stayed up, had a couple beers, and talked me through a two-hour process. I kid you not, it took two hours for one hour. Um, it's easier if you do a thousand at a time, but I was doing a single one, etc. So. And they can provide context. So they can sort of give you the bigger picture in terms of what you are doing. Um, the ITS barcode is just one region of DNA. We could have chosen a number of other ones, and they can help you situate the result of the ITS barcode within the results generated by other um, methods. Next slide. So what can Nexus folks do? So I spend a lot of time on Mushroom Observer. I'm realizing that my role in all of this is as a Nexus person, a middleman. I'm right between the body of people who are out in the woods and the people who have the resources, and then the academics on the other side. So what I do on Mushroom Observer is a lot of time I try and, sometimes I cause more trouble than I resolve, <laughs> but I try and bring people up to speed. I say, hey, next time you're out in the woods, collect this, because we're interested in it. So that's one thing that this middle person can do. Another thing is they can moderate when uh, academics go a little bit snippy at the public. Um, they can sort of make people feel bad about, you know, not collecting a specimen or not taking as nice of a photo as they could have, or not vouchering. And I say, hey, not everyone has the ability to make a voucher specimen every time. It takes a lot of time and space to do that. You need to take the data that you're getting for free from this wide body of people and count your lucky stars, because otherwise you wouldn't have it. Um, so I sort of see myself as an ambassador between academics, who, as Richard said, can be a little bit austere at times, and the public, which, as we all know, can be a little bit rambunctious at times, myself included. OK, next. We can create projects. Next slide. So in Santa Cruz Microflora, we have a couple of projects, more than two. But these are some of the ones that I'm most excited about and that haven't really gotten any traction yet. We want to establish sort of a, a network of post-oak monitoring 
um, stations where people adopt an oak tree and track the progress of death caps and native fungi under those oaks to see if death caps sort of continue to monopolize the root space of those oaks and push out the fruiting of natives over time. Now, it's important that we get all kinds of different oaks, ones that are already colonized heavily, ones that have just been colonized, and ones that have yet to show signs of infection with death caps. Anyways, I want to set this up as a project that people can submit data to on this SE Mycoflora that we can then package the results of and report to the world, because this is basically an academic ecology study of mycorrhizal invasion biology. Um, it's anecdotal because we're not going to be doing too much experimental analysis, but we want to see what happens to these trees over time. How many of you have noticed those little moths that bloom at the end of the summer and defoliate your oak trees almost completely? I want to get paired up with some people at UC Berkeley who are in the habit of taking root samples and find out what happens to the mycorrhizal fungi in those years that all their sugar source dries up because the leaves were gone for two months or three months. These are not normally deciduous oaks, but we have this sort of pseudo deciduous pattern where they lose leaves every third or fourth year. And I want to see if that catalyzes the change in the community of fungi on the roots, or if it puts them all in stress mode, or if they fruit more dramatically that year because they think their resource pool will dried up. But what is the role between this little insect that skeletonizes these leaves and the fungi associated with the trees that are affected? We can build narratives, and I think this is one of the most important things we can do as intermediate people between academics who don't have the time to, and the public who really wants these stories. What does all my data mean? Turn it into a story. What is happening out there in the woods? Mm -hmm. um, here's a little graph showing different ways to take data and turn it into narratives. There's two different ways, basically. Personal data shows people that their data made it into the database. It's there. So they can keep track of what they've found. Um, they get some feedback on it. But there's also aggregate data that situates their data within the larger body of data that people have submitted. What does it mean in relation to Ron's data? What does it mean in relation to Darwin's data? What are they finding that's different from mine? So you can sort of tell them about what the norm is. Are you finding a mushroom that's outside the norm of fruiting or outside the norm of its uh, geographic range? Um, and then you can just give them tools to do raw exploration, to have their own questions and go answer them on their own. Or find out there is no answer and come ask you, hey, we investigate this. Next. Um, so eBird, for those of you who use it, they have absolutely mastered this. They've got it dialed in. You get your portal where you see all the species you've ever seen, total up for the year, for the month, um, for your whole life, for different counties. That's the personal data. But next slide. You can also see, oh, there is the next slide here. You can also see aggregate data there um, where they sort of ask you, um, we want waterfowl data this week or this month. And you go out and observe ducks, and they use that to answer outstanding research questions in the field. Or rusty blackbirds, how many of you know that bird from the East Coast? It's declined about 90% in the past 100 years. They started a project saying, hey, we want as much rusty blackbird data as possible. Now this could totally be applied to mushrooms. Um, if there's a mushroom we expect is declining, like the agaricus that used to grow in the pastures here, mushroom observer could be harnessed with the help of a middleman to gather all this public data and give it to academics and say, hey, let's publish something on this. Let's make this phenomenon known. Um, in this one study, the authors found that initial participation in citizen science is a self-motivated thing, and long-term persistence depends on people giving them context and narrative and encouragement and sort of feedback. Um, so I think that's a really important role. You need a system of feedback. So I was talking to C.J. Ralph up in Humboldt County, and he said, when you're dealing with citizen science, you need to set the gates wide, accept as much data as possible, make everyone feel included, but make the door narrow. Take that last best cream of the crop data and use that for research. That way you can keep the academics happy, they're not worried about their data being dirty, but you're not alienating the public because you're not saying, hey, your data's no good. You can keep both sides happy by having a good filter in place that's behind the scenes. You don't want to really do it at the first step. You don't want to do it when people are submitting data. You want to do it later so that it sort of defuses the situation. Um, OK, next. When I went to the Cal Academy, this was my central message. Academics operating alone have no hope of achieving the combination of breadth, depth, and accessibility that's possible when they're partnered with people like you and I. Um, by having hundreds or thousands of people on the ground, 
taking data on mushrooms every week, every month, every year, for 100 years, there's no way that data set could ever be managed or managed uh, to be acquired by any number of grad students who are only going to be there for two or three years and, and professors who are spending primarily their time with the computer. So I really see it as a fruitful opportunity for both sides. We can stop just generating data because we can get narratives back and contribute to science and they can get the richest data sets they've ever had by harnessing what we're doing. So, last slide, I want to thank the Fungus Federation for making this possible and for showing the world that this is a sustainable model. I think we can keep doing this and have the model take hold elsewhere. So, congratulations. Thank you.